Well, Ephesians 6 1, we're in chapter 6. Uh, today we're going to come right up against the armor of God section, but not touch it. We'll deal with that in coming weeks. Ephesians 6 1, we saw children obey your parents in the Lord. What a wonderful verse. God answers the ultimate kid question before he even. Yeah, why? <laughs> Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Why? For this is right. We're not done with the whys, though. Why is it right? We got our answer from Colossians 3.20. Children, obey your parents in all things, for it is well-pleasing unto the Lord. And what we talked about last time, and I, I feel like I kind of raced through it, but children can know what to do. They can know the right thing to do, and they can know why. They're up there learning that right now. The right thing and being taught why. And I get it. I've got three of my own. You get so beaten down to where I, I saw a meme on the Internet where it was uh, from the Star Wars movies when uh, Darth Vader tells Luke that, you know, I'm your father, Luke. And that, <laughs> And Luke's crying, no, that's impossible. <laughs> that's how we feel a lot of times when somebody says, your children can obey, they can do the right thing, they can, they can learn the why. Like, no, that's impossible. <laughs> you start off very idealistic with child number one. By the time you get to child number three or four or five, the reality set in. But what our Bible taught us was that the child of all things has a job to do. They have a vocation. They have work. They are to obey their parents. They are to do what their parents say and know why because they're pleasing the Lord while they're doing it and it's right. And we looked at uh, Ephesians 4, if you turn back a page, Ephesians 4.1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness. I guess that means no stomping off and slamming doors. That's never happened in my house. You all know I'm a perfect parent. But think, <laughs> no amens again. <laughs> You've met my kids. Oh, <clears throat> I keep forgetting that. <laughs> but. Do you ever think about that? You know, we, we constantly teach our kids to obey, and you need to listen, and you need to do the right thing, but we never stop back and look at it like, hey, that's this child's job right now. That's their vocation. That's their calling from the Lord is to obey their parents and do the right thing and help be a part of your home and a part of your household and a contributor not just a resource, time, and money sucker. <laughs> Children should contribute. We should demand that of them in humility, in love. But children should not just be, you know, we. S How many families have you seen where it's like the, the parents running around chasing the child? Let me serve you, let me serve you, Johnny. That's not what our Bible lays out for children and families. And then, a child can even understand that it's not even about them necessarily in a large degree. It's not even about us as parents necessarily, but it's all pointed towards Christ. We want to be servants of Christ. We want to represent our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, in a proper way. Does it represent the Lord Jesus Christ in a proper way when the kid's running and screaming and his hair's on fire. No. Oh. <laughs> but what, it's, you know the verse in Titus where it talks about we are to adorn the doctrine? You think of it almost like a woman putting on jewelry. She's adorning herself. She's making herself look pretty and that's what we're told to do with the doctrine of God's word is to adorn it for them to see a loving family, polite children that are mostly obedient. <laughs> we had a family visit us and 
they were doing such a fabulous job with their kids. When they walked out of the house, I looked at my wife like, we're terrible. <laughs> but my kids actually called them the polite family. That was their name for it. And they were adorning the doctrine with their behavior, with the way they carried themselves. And uh, where we left off in Ephesians 6 was, Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up into the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And what I said when we read that verse, what you cannot fit in that verse is why? Because I told you so, you little jerk. Now shut up and go do it. That doesn't fit in Ephesians 6, 4, does it? Provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. And what is the dad dealing with most of the time? Ungrateful, selfish, self-centered, and that's children. They come out sinners. <laughs> so you're dealing with somebody who's taking you for granted, um, selfish, self-centered, and you're told, don't provoke them to wrath. How about the other way around? But the dad needs to, just like the kids, why should I do this? Well, you're pointing to Christ. The dad, in the same way, has to, I'm submitting myself unto Christ. I need to bring them up. I need to be long-suffering. I need to teach, I need to correct, exhort, instruct in righteousness. Amen. Life ain't fair. <laughs> Apparently I've been saying that a lot. I, I heard my son, his friend was complaining to him around the corner and I heard him say, life's not fair, get used to it. <laughs> like, oh. <laughs> huh? Way to go back. Yeah, yeah, exactly, but it's true. But Ephesians 5.21 said we're submitting ourselves to one another. The father is submitting himself to the servant role. I'm going to humbly serve my family. We saw that in the wives and husbands section. And it takes work. It takes an intentional effort. You know, any of you that have had kids, you know how easy it is to go from zero to 100. <laughs> And that wrath and anger just, you know, I was empty two seconds ago, and now I'm ready to explode. Explode, and then say, is that adorning the doctrine of Christ? Is that humble service? Is that reproof, instruction, and righteousness? No. But man, it feels good to let it out, doesn't it? Again, it's never happened to me. I'm speaking theoretically. Lying from the pulpit again, I heard that. Provoke not your children to wrath. Bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Now what about this, a child having a job? Do you understand how revolutionary that is in our culture now? You think my child should work in their childhood? People think that's crazy. There's a whole parenting scheme where I just want my child to enjoy life while they're with me. They can work the whole rest of their life. I just want them to have fun and enjoy life while they're here with me. <laughs> to those folks, I would ask a question. Why then? Do you take your child to sports practice? Why don't you just let them go to the games where they get to put their uniform on and have fun that way? You take them to practice because it's a controlled environment. They're putting in the effort, the work. They're learning the skills. They're doing the drills. They're doing all that stuff so they're ready come game time. But we're not going to do it with work. 
So at 18, you're going to ship out a great baseball player that's never worked a day in his life and is going to get fired from every job. Yay! At least they got to enjoy their childhood. We teach them work young. We're practicing in our home, in a controlled environment where you can measure and dictate the consequences so they learn how to work. You know, we, we think of heaven by the imagery that's portrayed in the popular culture as we're sitting on a cloud, playing a harp, singing Amazing Grace for 10,000 years, then repeat. But even in the Garden of Eden, sin hadn't entered yet. What are they doing? Working. They're taking care of things. God's order always has work being performed, things being tended to. So it is a godly thing to learn how to work, to teach your kids how to work. So you teach them work. What else are you teaching them in a controlled environment? You're teaching them why they're to obey their parents, why they're going to contribute to the family. You're teaching them it's not necessarily about you, it's not necessarily about me, but this is about eternal things. You need to learn to work for Christ as well. So now it's somebody that doesn't even physically live in the building. We're thinking about setting our affections on things above, the Savior which we cannot see. So I'm learning work, I'm learning how to finish a task, to do it properly, to contribute to an organization, my family, and you're also learning that I need to contribute as a member of the body of Christ. You know, those hymnals you open up, I didn't do all of them. There was work being done. <laughs> this is so hard. You did it wrong. You gotta you got flip them this way. Go, you gotta take all those apart and redo it. Why? <laughs> you're working for the Lord Jesus Christ right now. And for all the people in that building. They're learning something, something greater than themselves. You mean there's something that can be important in this world that's not me? Yes. That's what we're teaching our kids when we raise them. And you're not, no, I'll get to that in a minute. Bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Before I had children, one of the things I did was I watched people that I respected or that had well-behaved kids. <laughs> I listened to them and watched them trying to learn. And two things really stuck out to me that I still remember at the forefront of my memory. And the first one, I was talking about, well, I need to get a book so I can read the kid, kids' Bible stories. And the person stopped me and said, no, you will not do that. He said, these are not fairy tales. This is not fiction. This is Bible history. This is a history book. They are not Bible stories. They are Bible history. You're right. That was the first. The second one was, you are not raising children. You are raising adults. That changes your mindset. You know, suddenly now, when provoke not my children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, I now have a goal in front of me. I'm now taking the long view. I'm not bringing up a child. I'm bringing up an adult. How will the choice I make now with how I choose to nurture and admonish affect the goal? Or if I make this bad choice here, how hard will it be to get to the goal? It gives you perspective. It gives you a vision to where you're not just bouncing through every single day trying to survive until bedtime and then, <gasps> thank you. So that's something important to remember also. We're raising adults. And <laughs> it's funny, you see, people that they just never grew up, you know? And it's, it's a product of raising children instead of raising adults. It's funny. <laughs> this is next year 
I think I'm right on this. Next year will be the 75th anniversary of D-Day. I think next year is 75. And you think about it like, <laughs> these are 18 and 19 year old guys. What do you want to do? I don't know, let's go conquer Europe. Let's go defeat the Nazi empire. Let's hop off a boat where they have all the machine guns pointed at us and run at them. That's what our 18 and 19 year olds did 75 years ago. Now we have people sitting crying in their safe space because they read something on Twitter that upset them a lot. We've come a long way. We're churning out, all this raising children is churning out large children. That's what it is. We don't have adults. We have large children. Bring them up. Teach them how to be adults from their youth. That's what they want. Doesn't every 12-year-old want to be 14? Every 14-year-old wants to be 16. Every 16-year-old wants, they want to be older. You can, but I gotta teach you how first. You want responsibility, you want the, the privileges and the liberty that come with that next peg, you gotta earn it. That's what I, I had the most wonderful thing happen to me. I got to give my daughter her first <laughs> monthly bill. She wanted her phone activated. I said, you know what, I think that's a great idea because you know, if I'm having to leave you for two or three hours at some place and you're out there and the bad weather comes or something happens, I want you to be able to get a hold of me instantly. I think that's a fabulous idea. I will definitely activate your phone. She said, Great! I said, but you're paying for half of it. What? You want the liberty? You want to have a phone like an adult? You're going to pay for it. And your, the bill is going to come every single month on the same day, whether you have any money or not. Welcome to adulthood. But that's, it's the truth. That's showing them how to be an adult, right? That's bringing them up. And I, again, I've only got my family, so I can't use examples from your family. I'm not trying to toot my own horn, but that's a, an example of here we go. We're raising you up. How to function like a grown man, and grown man or grown woman instead of a, what is somebody, if somebody hasn't been trained up and taught how to be an adult, what are you spitting out to college? Somebody who's untrained, unexperienced, unmotivated, doesn't know how to work and doesn't know why. And we wonder why the kids are in their safe spaces crying about something they read on Twitter. Twitter, that's what the British call it, Twitter. And raising children, I, I, I've organized childhood into a couple phases. The first one I call the blob phase. Blob, where you, know, you can put them down right there and come back in an hour and they'll still be there. All I do is cry and eat and sleep and cry and eat and sleep and go to the bathroom. I call that the blob phase. Yeah. After the blob phase comes what I call suicide watch. When they're mobile. Look at that flight of stairs. Let's run down it. I barely know how to walk. You know what I'm talking about. It's when the gates come up and all that. That's suicide watch. You can start teaching and training your kids at Suicide Watch. You can start teaching them to work the right thing to do. I remember the day I first discovered I had a liar. You stay right there. Don't go over there and touch that. Daddy's told you not to touch that. I go over here like this. Watch, and I see her going, She goes over to it, and as soon as I walk back in the room, it's the hand was opening the door, and <laughs> can't even hardly walk, and I've got a little lying jerk already. <laughs> Sinner! But you can start teaching them and training them 
obey your parents. Listen, here's the why, here's the consequence. They can understand at that age. And they want order, they want discipline. They want to have a home that makes sense, that has order and rules and parenting. They, you may not think that when they're on the floor screaming and banging their feet in their hands, and, but children want order. And it's our job as parents to give it to them, to model Christ, to model grace, peace, liberty. But most of all, what comes with liberty? Go back to the phone bill, right? Responsibility. The bill's coming whether you have money or not. You have liberty. Liberty is responsibility. We can teach that to all of our children's children. And I can prove that to you from the Old Testament in your Bible. Do you remember when um, the guy came up to Jesus and he said, Master, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus essentially says, well, how about 1 through 4 and 5 through 10? That was his answer. He summed up the first four commandments, thou shalt love the Lord thy God. Love and then he summed up the last 5 through 10, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I think that's funny. I think, I know God has a sense of humor. He created it in us. But love thy neighbor as thyself, the second commandment. Well, that takes you all the way back to Deuteronomy 6. Well, let me try my new handy dandy Bible tabs here. Look at that. Like a champ. Already at Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 5. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. And shall talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. That's pretty much all day, isn't it? What are they teaching them there? Not teaching them wonderful grace of Jesus. They're teaching them the law. 613 points of the law. And he's saying, your kids can get this. You need to teach them diligently this. So if Old Testament Israel can and did teach their children the law of God, 613 points, what's our excuse? We can't teach grace, mercy, and peace in Christ Jesus? We can't teach liberty and responsibility? We can't teach Jesus paid it all? Trust Him. Now here's your response to that for the rest of your life? What's our excuse? Hmm. Now one final thing before we move on. I know I've spent a lot of time on a couple of verses. But man, I mean, think about it. We, we talk about Ephesians 3.9 all the time. Make all men see. Make all men see. Rightly dividing 2 Timothy 2.15. That starts at home. That needs to start at home. You know why? It's easier to fix your mistakes at home. You're not quite as approved a workman, workwoman as you want to be. It's easier to fix within the four walls of that house. Your Ephesians 3.9 starts at home. Now, let me try my handy dandy Bible tabs again. This is beautiful. Provoke not your children to wrath. Ephesians 6, 4, where we've been studying for months. <laughs> Provoke, do you know what the fastest way to not do that verse, if you're a father or your parent? The fastest way to provoke your children to wrath, be a hypocrite and a liar. They usually come together. Do you ever scream at your kids? Stop screaming! <laughs> Shut up! I'm so sick of your mouth! Hmm. Scream at them for their angry outburst. 
Lie to them when they ask you a question you don't want to answer. Now they know their parent's a liar. How's that going to work when you go to nurture and admonish them? People look at me like I'm crazy because I never told my kids about the Tooth Fairy or Santa Claus or anything like that. I just, I'm like, I don't want to lie to my kids. <laughs> and it, it goes back from my experience when I was old enough to wait all night. And I knew what it sounded like when my brothers would walk on the roof of the house right above my bedroom. I could hear their footsteps. So I waited up all night for that sleigh. I knew I would hear reindeer hoofs, and I would hear that sleigh all night. Never heard a thing. But go downstairs, and I knew, look what Santa Claus brought you. Liar, liar. But it's, it's true. Do not lie to your children. If it's our job to bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, we have to be honest with them. And sometimes I honestly say, you're not old enough to know the answer to that question. I'm not going to tell you the answer to that now. That one works pretty well. Because there's some conversations you, know, you don't have with a 7-year-old, do you? Some things you don't talk about with a 12-year-old. But it just comes down to, I will not lie, but I may say I'm not giving you the answer right now. What's another way to provoke your children to wrath? How about be proud and arrogant as the ruler of your home? You will do so because I said so, and I rule this house, and you eat because I provide you food, and you sleep because I provide you a bed. Well, that's not the mind of Christ, is it? Humble service. He humbled himself and took, himself, took upon himself the form of a servant, Philippians 2. What's the fastest way to obey that verse? One of the fastest ways. Provoke not your kids to wrath, children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Two words. I'm sorry. You ever apologize to your children? No! They're just kids! Look who's not being humble. There's no parent that's perfect outside of me. Think about it, though. When you say, I'm sorry to a child, you're telling them, I'm wrong, too. I know I've pointed out the 37 things you did wrong today, but I mess up, too. And I'm big. I'm grown up. I'm sorry. It takes a humble position. I've wronged you. And that's a wrong thing, even though you're my child. I'm the parent, you're the child, but it's still wrong for me to wrong you. Wow. What does that do to the child now? He's not just yelling at me because he's yelling at me. Maybe he really does want me to grow up and be a productive citizen. <laughs> Three words then. I was wrong. Daddy's not perfect. I'm a sinner too. You know, that's why Christ had to die. Because I was, I was sinning a long time before you were born. And I still sin. So now it's not parent versus child. Both of you are sitting on the same side of the aisle saying, we both need Christ. We both need God's word. What comes after that? Four words. Will you forgive me? Do you see what you've done to the child now? You've given the child and their feelings and their position, you've given it worth. I don't want to have wronged you. I want to make this right with you because you have value. 
I've sinned. I want to fix this. I want to take care of that. I understand Christ paid for all of our sins, but there's an offense between us. I want to solve that offense. That kind of stuff goes a long way <laughs> towards preventing you from provoking him to wrath. You can get away with that. Would you stop screaming? <laughs> I was wrong. I speak from some experience. Like I said, I'm not done raising up my kids, but I have an eight-year-old that's been described as the strongest-willed young boy the music teacher's ever met. And she's only been teaching music for 27 years. I've got an almost teenager girl. My middle child is 28 years old, and she's the CEO of a major American corporation. That's how she acts. I mean, she's only 11. But it's not easy. But it's possible. That's what I, I, when I read these verses, it's hope. It's possible. We can do this. We can raise up adults. We can raise up responsible members of the body of Christ. And how amazing it is to, to turn out somebody who knows how to work, knows why, knows who they are in Christ, knows how a family should operate, knows what the point of this life is, taking a long view, thinking on eternal things and about their Savior. Send that out in the world. Is that glorious? It's real messy getting to that point. <laughs> but again, think about the goal. You keep the goal in mind. What a glorious day that will be when you send that out into the world. Oh, and there's eternal consequences to all that too. If that, you know, then there's that. Souls saved for all eternity and saints edified. That's a good thing too. We serve the Lord with humility of mind. <clears throat> now let's do a few more verses and we'll be done here. Servants. We talked about a few weeks ago what happens if a master and a servant are both standing there and they both hear the gospel and they both trust Christ and get saved. What happens now? Am I still your servant? Am I still your master? Hmm. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling and singleness of heart. Why? As unto Christ. This, I want you all to be aware of this. The progressives who hate your Bible and hate your Christianities and hate your values will take you to this verse and tell you, see your Bible is an old bigoted book written by white men who love slavery. Your Bible condones slavery. Has anybody ever heard that before? Just me? It's out there. Did white men write the Bible? It was given unto the Jews. But it says servants to masters. Is that talking about the slavery that we had in our country? Where human beings are bought and sold like furniture? Could you imagine that? And I know every society has its sensibilities, but you, could you imagine if there was a time machine and you can go back there and be standing there in the market where people are being bought and sold like horses. I'll take that one and uh, I'll take that one. Well, you just took the father away from a whole family. Yeah, he'll be a good worker. Let's go. Does our Bible endorse that? Depends on who you ask. There are people that have taught for hundreds of years that the Bible endorses that. Klu Klux Klansmen 
would use Bible verses to defend their practice. The so-called racial prophecy. What's that? Yeah, the devil knows the Bible too. Good point. The devil was quoting Bible too. So was the Klansman. What your Bible talks about in servanthood, you see servanthood happen for a variety of reasons in your Bible. One is uh, you went to war with nation, nation A went to war with nation B, and you lost. All right, here's the spoils of war. These are now your servants. The other thing is Bible people were so stupid. You know, now when somebody robs of us of a few million dollars, what's the consequence? We say, you robbed this person of so many million dollars. What we're going to do to you is we're going to make you go live over here, and we're going to pay for everything for you for five years and not let you leave the building. We'll show you. What happened in the Bible is if you steal, you lost all this, guess what? You're now their servant until you pay the bill off. So silly, right? Yeah. The Bible does not endorse the subjugation of people because of how much, what is it, melanin, melatonin, whatever gives you color in your skin. It says nothing about that. Acts 17 has been in the Bible for a few weeks now. And it said, God has made of one blood all nations on the earth. People are people. One blood, all nations of men. But wicked men for centuries, and some till today, try to use the Bible to say the Bible promotes slavery. And that's what people attack your Bible on. I bring that up to make you aware of it so you're not surprised when somebody takes you to it. But servants and masters. The point... Do you see anything in there about pray really hard and God will set you free from your servitude? He's got a wonderful plan for your health, wealth, and prosperity, servant. Why, you just pray this simple prayer. There's nothing in there about that, is there? It's telling you how to act despite your circumstance. So if you had to be a servant or a master, which one would you pick? Wouldn't be a servant, would it? But he's telling you who are in this circumstance, this is how you're to conduct yourself. This is how to act. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling and signalness of heart as unto Christ. Set your affections on things above. Here you are cleaning the toilet. As unto Christ. I'm a servant. Take the servants and masters out of it. How about you just started your minimum wage job? As unto Christ. Mop on the floor, as unto Christ. I'm doing a good job with a good attitude. Do you ever hear that taught in church? Hallelujah. <laughs> be the best servant you could be. Do it unto the Lord. No. You hear health, wealth, and prosperity. 1 Corinthians 7 talks about it. Thou shalt not mock me in my Bible tabs. <laughs> 721. Art thou called being a servant? Care not for it. But if thou mayest be made free, use it rather. For he that is called in the Lord being a servant is the Lord's free man. Whoa. Likewise also he that is called being free is Christ's servant. Ye are bought with a price. Be not ye servants of men. Think about that. Put yourself in the cage being bought and sold. He's a servant. He has no control over his day-to-day -day life. He's separated from his family. He has to work for free. And Christ tells him in 1 Corinthians, you may be stuck here, but you are my free man. 
What does that do to you if you're in that situation? I may have to suffer through this now, but I am God's free man. And I am headed for heavenly places with him when I'm out of this life. And it will all come out in the wash. The rewards will be passed out and the punishments will be passed out. And all the wrongs are going to be made right. I am God's free man. These kinds of things, you know, we, we can't understand this. We've never lived anything like this. We are too rich and comfortable in America to understand anything like this. But we can study and learn, because it may not be like this forever in America. You never know. We're not, you know, people talk about the 99% and the 1%. The fact that we live here, we're the 1%. We're not very woke to the 99% of the world. <laughs> you like that one. Okay, a couple more and we'll finish up. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling and singleness of heart as unto Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. No stomping away and slamming doors when you're told what to do. <laughs> Notice it says masters according to the flesh. That's an important distinction to make. You have no master of your soul if you're saved other than the Lord Jesus Christ. There's one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So nobody can be a master of your soul. You all know what eye service is, right? Eye service, you know what that is? You work really hard for the three minutes the boss walked into the room. And then you throttle back to cruise level effort. I don't know anything about that. I used to run a cut shop years ago with entry level workers. I learned about eye service real fast. I don't understand how you didn't get all this done. I've watched you work for five minutes. You're clicking them out super fast. How is this not done? Whew. Turns out things change when he goes back into his office, right? I service. What do you teach if I'm a representative of Christ in my servant role, in my job role, what have you just taught your boss about Christ? Now, you're the Jesus guy in the shop, I would hope. You're the Jesus lady on the shift. What have you just taught them? The Jesus person is lazy and a liar. That's not adorning the doctrine, is it? That's a wonderful representation of the Lord Jesus Christ. The first thing Paul says about himself in the beginning of Romans, Paul, a servant. A servant of Jesus Christ. That was the first thing out of his mouth when he met the Lord on the road to Damascus. What wilt thou have me to do? What was Christ's response? I'll tell you what you must do. A servant of Jesus Christ. In every situation, and again, it's not, it doesn't talk about how to get out of your circumstance or how to, if you just look, God's got a secret plan for your life that he's trying to show you through circumstance. Nothing like that is how to act in the circumstance. How to act in the role. A servant of Jesus Christ. Well, what if, what if your master, your boss, what if he's not saved? What if he's not fair? What if he's cruel? What if he's unjust? Then I cannot do that other stuff, right? He's unjust, unfair, and cruel. I didn't see any different rules in there, did I, for unjust, unfair, and cruel? That's harder. <laughs> Is it harder to serve a master who's unfair, unjust, and cruel? There's no plan B in these verses, is there? Humble servant. Well, that's unfair. 
the most unfair event that ever occurred in human history. The most unjust and cruel thing happened to our Savior. Philippians 2. Did he go to the cross crying and stomping his feet saying, It's not fair! That's Philippians 2. Let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus, who took upon himself the form of a servant and was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. I know they didn't tell you that when you signed up to be a Christian and you came down front and signed the card. But this has been in the Bible a long time, and it's our job. How do you do that? Well, dead reckoning is a good start. Reckon ourselves indeed dead, the old man dead. Finally, the, another way to help you do it, let's say you have an unjust, unfair, cruel master, boss, whatever. You find yourself in a terrible situation. Verse 8 can be helpful. Knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. Amen. You got rewards coming. You all know 1 Corinthians 3, talking about building on the foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. Colossians 3, 22 through 25 talks about that some more as well. But this, finally, I'll say finally and actually mean it this time. Huh? Yeah. See what it means when a preacher says, finally, nothing. But you think about, you know the verse that talks about we look on the things which are not seen? How's that work? I look on the things which are not seen. It goes back to setting your affections on things above, but think about you watch somebody not with eye service as men pleasers, but with a glad heart, doing their job with a good attitude, serving their master as unto Christ. And what you think you're looking at is a minimum wage employee cleaning toilets. Or a minimum wage whatever, mopping the floor or cutting the grass. That's what you see, don't you? But according to these verses, if you're following these verses with this heart and mind, what you're actually seeing, it's not somebody earning $9 an hour. You're, here, you're seeing somebody racking up millions in heavenly places. And guess what? There's no inflation in heaven. So a million dollars today will be a million dollars a million years from now. You've heard what's happening in Venezuela, right? They've got to take a wheelbarrow full of cash to buy some bananas because of inflation. There's no inflation in heaven. But that's what these verses say. You will receive a reward. Masters, you get to do whatever you want. No, that's not what it says, does it? Masters, do the same things unto them, forbearing, threatening. Now, that sounds a lot like the fathers, doesn't it? Forbearing, threatening, knowing what? You're not the boss of everything, are you? Knowing that your master also is in heaven. Neither is there respect of persons with him. Reward, it said bond or free, didn't it? You'll be judged just like your servant will be judged. So that, I think, is a good place to stop. Does anybody else have any thoughts or comments?